All right, so we left off on Lyndon Johnson, and you guys will remember that we talked about 1968 being this critical year in American history. So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to go through the PowerPoint slides, uh, and then I'm going to upload the video, and I'm going to upload the slides. So you can look at the slides while I'm lecturing, and you can uh, take notes as need be. Uh, but just a reminder what's happened uh, in America. So 1968, we've had these major issues, right? We've seen uh, that... Our, uh, Robert F. Kennedy has been killed. We've seen that Martin Luther King has been killed. Lyndon Johnson has said that he is not going to be running for re-election. We had the issues at the Democratic National uh, Conference. And we had uh, the Tet Offensive at the beginning of the year, right? So it's not a good time to be a Democrat in office right now. It's not a good time to be a progressive. And 1968 really is going to be that turning point year that allows us to see uh, Richard Nixon, uh, our new president, to, uh, to come into office and make some real change. So today's going to be about Richard Nixon, the change that he brought about, and really uh, what he did. This is going to be three PowerPoint presentations. This first one is just going to be kind of Nixon as a whole, and then we'll kind of build on it and see what he did foreign policy-wise. We'll look domestic policy. The big thing for Richard Nixon, like it was for Lyndon Johnson, is Vietnam. Vietnam's going to be a major issue for Richard Nixon like it was for Lyndon Johnson. Uh, now, you guys have this great thing now where you can pause, rewind, rewatch anything you need to so you don't have to complain that I'm going too fast in the lectures. So who was Richard Nixon? Uh, you'll remember that Richard Nixon was vice president of Dwight Eisenhower, right? During his presidency, he ran for president in 1960, but the dude was sweaty and could not handle himself on live TV during the debate, right? You guys remember that we talked about it. People that listened to the debate thought that Richard Nixon had just taken care of business. People that watched the debate thought that he was uh, nervous, uh, that he would not be ready for the job, right? Um, but he's got a good reputation, right? He's got a reputation as a tough politician, He's got a reputation of being an enemy of communism, right? Uh, he had that kitchen debate with uh, Khrushchev that we talked about when he was vice president. He's also kind of been known as um, willing to kind of punch below the belt, right? He's gotten this uh, nickname called Tricky Dick, right? Dick is a nickname for uh, the name Richard. And kind of because of that, he's got this low self-esteem. I wouldn't say that's the only reason he's got low self-esteem, but Richard Nixon really is going to hate the media. He's going to hate uh, people that question his presidency, right? He's going to wiretap. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But the election of 1968. So remember we said that the Democratic Party is just in absolute chaos, right? Robert F. Kennedy has been assassinated. Uh, there's riots outside of the convention, uh, and the party has just been destroyed because of Vietnam. Hubert Humphrey is going to be the eventual nominee. He's Lyndon Johnson's current uh, vice president. Okay, The Republicans nominate Richard Nixon. And under this promise of... Um, of uh, sorry. Uh, bringing America together, right? We're going to restore stability, right? We're having all these issues in America during this time, and we're going to bring back honor to the White House. We're going to bring peace and honor in Vietnam. We're going to finish the conflict and we're going to fix things. And he's going to appeal what is known as the silent majority. This idea of people who are not out and, and fighting, right? And they're not out standing in the middle of the streets and protesting. It's these large amount of American people who just want the best for America. They're not looking for chaos, right? They're not looking for a crazy change. They just want America to be stable. And Nixon's really going to win in a landslide to a degree, right? Um, maybe not landslide. He's going to win by a good amount. He's going to win 43% of the vote. Largely, he's going to win because George Wallace in the South, you'll remember he was the governor of uh, Alabama, and he is going to run under the American Independent Party. And he's going to appeal to Americans who are upset about the Democratic Party's decision to give rights to African Americans. He's going to win five states, guys, and part of North Carolina. He's going to win 46 electoral votes. He's going to be the most successful third-party candidate since Teddy Roosevelt in the Bull Moose Party. Um, and he's going to split a fraction of the Democratic Party, which is going to allow for Richard Nixon to win 301 electoral votes to Hubert Humphrey's 190. 
Okay, so the solid South is going to remain solid, but it's going to be solid under the American Independent Party under George Wallace. So Richard Nixon, um, he comes in that we're going to bring in peace and and uh, honor to Vietnam. So his foreign policy, okay, he's got a new policy in Vietnam, right? He wants to reduce the amount of domestic opposition to the war and give himself more political maneuverability, meaning he wants to have more leeway uh, in what he can do in Vietnam, and he's going to support changing the way the draft works to a more lottery system. He's also going to create this policy known as Viet Vietnamization. This idea that we're going to train the Southern Vietnamese army so that they can fight the war and Americans aren't having to do it. And in 1969, we're going to see the first Americans be withdrawn from Vietnam itself. Okay, so Americans are like, sweet, we're starting to get out of Vietnam. Things are going to change. Problem. 1970. Okay, Richard Nixon, uh, the previous year, secretly is going to start bombing North Vietnamese bases in Cambodia, right? He's going to completely destabilize the area of Cambodia, which runs along the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? We looked at that. And he's going to support a coup d'etat, an overthrow of the government in Cambodia. And then in April 1970, he's going to announce that he's going to send troops across the border of Vietnam and into Cambodia to clear out enemy bases, okay? Now this anti-war movement is going to totally reignite. We're going to see a march on Washington. And in November 1970, Congress is going to repeal the Gulf of Trung Tonkin Resolution, right? Remember, that was what initially gave the president this blank check to do whatever he wanted in Vietnam. And now they're going to take that away and say, hey, we have to try and get out of Vietnam. This is getting so much worse. And then we're going to see the Kent State Massacre, just these big anti-war movements across college campuses, right? In May of 1970, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen the image before where you have the, the, um, the soldiers standing on the university and then you have the hippie students walking along and then they put the daisies in the rifles. Well, the Kent State Massacre was when the National Guard opened fire on those students and killed four students. Guys, things are going to get really bad in America in 1970. Then in 1971, there's a great movie uh, called The Post, and it's all about the Pentagon Papers. And it's a leaking of papers from the Pentagon and um, just showing that the government has been completely dishonest in their reporting of the war. We're not winning like they've been saying. We're not doing well like they've been saying. A lot of people are dying. The northern Vietnamese are not showing any signs of slowing. And it's showing that the war itself is unwinnable. We are unable to change the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese, and it's not going to be successful. And by 1971, the United States is exhausted. Okay, There's been signs of decay within the military itself. We have a lot of people just deserting, drug addiction, racial hostilities in Vietnam, uh, a refusal to obey orders, right? And then... A sign of, of this is the My Lai Massacre of 1971, okay? And it's a, a, a sign of the decay in that the United States Army massacres more than 300 South Vietnamese citizens, guys. Things are just getting bad to worse to worse in Vietnam. Why? Because we're tired. We're tired. So in January of 1974, the Paris Peace Accords are going to be signed. Paris, we've talked about this how many times, right? Paris is where you go to settle your differences. So by 1971, nearly two thirds of Americans are urging for withdrawal from Vietnam. The war is gonna drag on another three years. Okay, what are the Paris Peace Accords? So they're nego negotiated by National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger. It's gonna call for immediate ceasefire. Okay, you gotta know this. You gotta know that this ends Vietnam. It's gonna call for an immediate ceasefire. American prisoners of war are gonna be handed over immediately. South Vietnam's government would be allowed to continue to be a democratic state. Uh, North Vietnam's army would be allowed to be remain to remain in the South. Okay, is this peace with honor though? Were we successful? Many say no. Right? Many say that the Vietnam War is an absolute catastrophe. Many say that it's a failure of American foreign policy, and it's the beginning of the end of trust in 
American government. Why? Because a lot of people are watching what's happening in the war. Okay, we're turning on the TV and we're seeing the death count every single day, right? So what's the legacy, right? The price of the war. So it's going to cost the United States one hundred and fifty billion dollars. Fifty five thousand Americans are going to be killed. Three hundred thousand soldiers are going to be injured, right? It's a blow to our confidence and our self esteem, right? The middle class, middle class. And the working class are going to kind of be at war with each other. Why? Because the middle class, a lot of them are living in suburbia, right? They have a different reality to a degree of what the working class, right, of America has. So it's working class versus middle class, right? Then we have hawks versus doves. This idea of hawks being pro-war and doves being pro-peace. That's pretty easy to know, right? Doves are peaceful. Hawks, right? You, when you think of a hawk, you don't necessarily think peace. And again, this credibility gap in the United States. Now, what's the price in Indochina? We see genocide in Cambodia, right? Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge is going to kill one in three Cambodians, right? These are the people that we um, supported to take over in Cambodia, and there's going to be genocide in that country. Vietnam is going to be ravaged by decades of continued war within the country. The economy is going to be left in ruins. It's going to remain one of the poorest and most politically oppressive nations in the world. We're just going to destroy Indochina. Still to this day, the war in Vietnam, for us it's known as the Vietnam War, but in Vietnam, when you talk about it, it's known as the War of American Aggression. Very different, right, in what we see versus what the Vietnamese see. Now, what are things like for Richard Nixon outside of Vietnam? Right? What's his foreign policy as a whole? Well, he's got a Cold War background, right? He's been in Eisenhower's administration. He knows what's going on as a whole in uh, the Soviet Union versus the United States. Okay, he understands the U.S. and the USSR are continuing to knock it along. We have this continued series of confrontations between the United States and the Soviets, right? The Berlin Airlift. The Berlin Wall, Cuban Missile Crisis, even the Bay of Pigs, you can argue. So Richard Nixon and his National uh, Security Advisor and later Secretary of State know this guy, Henry Kissinger, know the name, box it, star it, highlight it, know who he is. They're going to argue that communism is not a monolith. Not every communist country is the same. Not every communist group is the same. We cannot treat every communist country as one. Right, they're going to call for detente, right, which is a relaxation of tensions between the United States and the communist world. How are we going to do that? Well, Richard Nixon is going to take unprecedented steps, right, as a foreign policy president in China. He's going to uh, he's going to send Henry Kissinger on secret trips to communist China to lay groundwork for Richard Nixon to meet with the Chinese government and most specifically the um, communist premier Mao Zedong. Right. In 1972, Richard Nixon is going to stun the world by traveling to China. Guys, it's a big deal. OK, this is going to normalize relationships between China and the United States. You've got to know Mao Zedong meeting with Richard Nixon is a big deal. You've got to know it. OK. What's he trying to do, though? Is it just about building relations with China? I mean, yeah, that's a big deal, but no, that is not the only reason. He's trying to show that China and the USSR are not as strong of a relation as the USSR thinks that they have, right? He is thinking that if we build a relationship with China, the largest country in the world, or at least the second largest behind India, we're going to show that the United States can work with anybody, whereas the Soviet Union is not trying to make any efforts to build those relations. Now, detente with the Soviet Union. Richard Nixon, again, he's going to be very successful in his relations with China, but he's also going to take it a step further in 1972, and that's going to be a, a big year for him, right? He's going to meet with uh, Mao Zedong, but he's also going to be the first American president to visit Moscow in 1972. Know it, box it, start it, highlight it. The guy goes to China, the guy goes to Soviet Union. 
just a few years earlier, we're trying to overthrow governments in, in Cuba and we're almost at nuclear war with them, right? Richard Nixon is extremely successful in his ability to work with these other countries around the world. And then we're going to have a landmark treaty with the Soviet Union. Okay, these few slides are extremely important, guys. We're going to sign the SALT-1 Treaty. Okay, this is the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. Okay, this idea that we need to stop building these um, nuclear uh, bombs because what's going to happen? What's the difference between having a hundred or a thousand? It only takes a couple dozen to destroy the world, right? We don't need ten thousand of these intercontinental ballistics. Um, to be in our arsenal, okay? We're also going to expand trade between the two countries, right? There's two superpowers in the world. We can't just turn our backs on one another if we want to be successful. One second, I'm going to grab something to drink. like a sponsor break okay so um the nixon doctrine right so the third world is going to be is going to remain extremely extremely volatile during this time period right who's in charge of the western hemisphere america is but we're going to see under nixon that the united states is going to participate in more of uh, defense and development for allies and friends, but are going to leave the basic responsibility of your future, right, to the nations themselves, right? So we'll help build your defense. We'll help develop um, countries to a degree, but it's your job to develop for the future. Um, countries aren't really going to like that, especially third world countries who are going to feel that the United States has kind of turned their back on, on them right? We're going to see a large rise of author authoritarian regimes in Africa, in um, the Western Hemisphere. Um, and this is largely because um, America kind of ignores them, right? So while Nixon is successful in working on the big names, right, and working with the big people, he doesn't do as good of a job of working with these developing nations that really need America at this time. So, what are things like in America during the presidency of Richard Nixon? Well, um, he's going to dismantle the Great Society, right? He's going to argue that the Great Society programs have led to a in huge increase in federal spending, right? And a huge increase in federal influence. And Republicans, you'll remember, are for smaller government, right? They don't want the big hand of federal government coming in and trying to solve the day, right? The, these are the people that Herbert Hoover argued um, we needed rugged individualism during the Great Depression. People just need to tough it out and we'll be okay. Um, I mean, at times that just isn't realistic, right? Uh, Richard Nixon wants to reduce the size of the federal government drastically. Um, and a lot of his policies uh, were a response to this. Right? Um, they're a response to the middle class people who he called the silent majority, right? We don't need federal government. You guys are okay on your own. You don't need us. And this plan is going to be known as new federalism, right? We talked about federalism being this idea of the federal government, right? And their role. Um, and it's this plan of kind of offshoring federal power to state and local governments, right? Um, States' rights. States' rights versus federalism, okay? The federal government versus the rights of the states. Um, and under this policy of revenue sharing, um, state and local governments could spend federal dollars however they wanted within certain limits, right? If money is allotted to schools, you can't go create a secret military in your state. Well, um, what's going to happen, okay? is Nixon is going to have a lot of battles with the Supreme Court um, and the liberal tendencies of the Supreme Court under Chief Justice Earl Warren, right? You remember that Earl Warren is going to be the person that is going to be the Supreme Court justice that sees Brown v. Board of Education, right? And we see these changes. So some examples of this, right? A couple that I want you to know. Uh, Miranda v. Arizona, 1966, right? 
Um, some of you may be like, what the heck is Miranda v. Arizona? Well, if you've ever seen cops, which I'm assuming some of you know what it is, when you get arrested, what are you told? You have a right to remain silent. You have the right to an attorney. Anything you say can and will be used against you, right? This used to not be the case, right? Under the Supreme Court and Miranda v. Arizona, that's why it's called Miranda, right? And have you been Mirandized? Um, this was a direct result of the Supreme Court protecting the rights of individuals saying you can't arrest somebody and not tell them uh, their rights. They have to know their rights, okay? Another one is uh, Roth v. United States, which is going to limit, okay, the authority of local governments to um, eliminate uh, adult uh, entertainment. You guys can figure out what, what that is, right? But this is a big deal. Think about this. Um, in the early 1900s, I mean, women are not showing their shoulders. And now we have adult entertainment. And the federal government and the Supreme Court is telling you, guys, this is Americans' right. They're allowed to do it. Uh, so big changes, right? Richard Nixon is not happy about this. Okay, Richard Nixon is going to be make, make it very clear that this is not the America that we want to see. Okay, And in 1969, Chief Justice Earl Warren is going to retire. Okay, and we are going to see a new nominee under President Richard Nixon, and he is going to nominate uh, Berger. Okay, uh, and Chief Justice Berger is going to um, be conservative, but not as conservative as Richard Nixon uh, had hoped. Right? Here's the example. I'll give you two. Uh, the first one's going to be Furman versus Georgia, which is going to restrict the death penalty. Um, but the other two, and one of them is one that we, two, both of them are actually both ones that we talked about. Um, the first one, 1973, know this box star highlight, Roe v. Wade, guys. This is under Berger, right? This is under the guy that Richard Nixon is supposed to have assured us is going to bring back conservative morals back to America. Uh, this is going to legalize abortion. This is going to be still an issue 50 years later. And the other one is going to be Bakke versus the Board of California Regents, which is in 1978. This is after Richard Nixon has left office. But you guys will remember my ability to do math on the whiteboard, right, and how we um, allow individuals into the United States. This says that affirmative action is not allowed um, because it restricts right people's rights okay if you're gonna have it there has to be these strict guidelines that you follow for affirmative action to um, be held but just free affirmative action is no longer um, allowed um, now economically okay for 30 years we've seen a strong economy in the United States right the 40s the 50s the 60s we've seen success right the United States has become a global superpower Unfortunately, in the 1970s, we're going to see that first decline, okay? The biggest problem is a huge amount of soaring uh, inflation, right? Um, what causes inflation? Deficit spending, right? Spending money that you don't have, printing more money that you, you don't have, and the rising cost of oil, okay? Um, OPEC, which some of you may have heard of in the last couple of weeks in the news, OPEC is the organization of petroleum and energy in the Middle East, okay? So OPEC is going to be the largest producer of oil in the world, and the United States is going to kind of be at the mercy of the prices that OPEC sets to a degree. Um, the second problem is a decline in manufacturing jobs. Um, aging infrastructure and factories have made us less efficient, right? And a lot of people are now offshoring jobs. They're sending jobs um, to other countries. Okay, um, and they're never going to come back. They're never going to come back. Nixon's going to try to deal with some of these issues. Unfortunately, none of them are going to be successful. Um, but in 1972, Richard Nixon is up for re-election. He sees that George Wallace was successful in 1968 in taking some of the states in the South away from the Democrats. So what does Nixon do? Nixon is going to create the Southern strategy, which is going to keep the Southern states Republican to this date, guys. The Republican Southern strategy is going to begin under Richard Nixon. Know this. Um, he's going to use policies um, to court votes of white Southerners 
um, and shift them from their allegiance to Democrats to Republicans. Um, he's going to play on their racial prejudices, right? He wouldn't openly support civil rights, um, but he opposed forced busing, right? So this idea that everyone is entitled to public transportation. He's going to play on the fears of a lack of law and order, right? He's going to be the president of law and order, okay? He's going to talk about protecting the silent majority, and in, 19, <laughs> in 1972, um, arguably the biggest landslide in American history, Richard Nixon is going to win 49 states. 49 states. Think about that. 49 of the 50 states. The only state that George McGovern is going to win is Massachusetts. Um, 49 states. Okay. And he's going to love life for a little bit, right? He's going to get that validation um, until Watergate. Until Watergate. And we'll talk about Watergate a little bit right now. Um, but just understand what Watergate is, right? Um, Richard Nixon is going to have five men who work for him break in to the Democratic National Headquarters. Um, and... They're going to just try and get information on George McGovern and these ideas of what is really happening with the Democratic Party. What do they have on us? What are they trying to, um, what dirt do they have on Richard Nixon? And it's ultimately going to lead to people seeing Richard Nixon as this imperial president, right? Um, and what's going to happen is Democratic Congress is going to become very hostile to his goals. Um, Richard Nixon is going to try and circumvent con Congress whenever he can. And we're going to see almost a king-like view of Richard Nixon. Where have we seen that, guys? Where image did we see of a president being seen as a monarch? I hope Andrew Jackson is quickly kind of going off in your brain. And in 1974, the federal government is going to sue Richard Nixon, um, knowing full well that Richard Nixon has been secretly recording every conversation in his office since he became president. Richard Nixon refuses to hand over the tapes. He cites executive privilege, this idea that the president isn't necessarily above the law, but there are certain things that the president is allowed to know that the rest of the country is not. Okay, And the Supreme Court is going to rule that the president is not above the law, and he must hand over the tapes. Notice, Nixon the United States is going to show that the president is not above the law. So, what happens? Richard Nixon hands over the tapes? Absolutely not. Richard Nixon resigns. Okay? Um, the tapes are eventually going to be released, but it's going to show that there are parts of the tapes that have been destroyed, um, covered over, right? And Richard Nixon is going to resign in 1974. You guys will remember, I'm not a crook. Um, and the vice president, uh, Gerald Ford, who was the Speaker of the House, uh, is going to become President of the United States. Uh, and then, you know, we talked about the Paris uh, Peace Accords, right? In 1975, uh, the Paris Peace Accords are a failure, right? We're going to see a civil war in Vietnam. In March of 1975, the North Vietnamese are going to invade the South. Um, South Vietnam is going to call on the United States for help. Congress says absolutely not. We're not getting back into that. The communists take over South Vietnam, and South Vietnam falls. Okay, and the fall of Saigon in 1975 is going to see uh, Americans fleeing into helicopters, um, trying to get out of Saigon, out of the U.S. Embassy in South Vietnam. So what looked like a successful presidency for Richard Nixon early on is quickly going to be seen as a failure, right? So this is lecture number one on Richard Nixon. We'll talk more about him later on. If you guys have questions, do me a favor, comment on Google Classroom on the video link. The slides are going to be on this as well, and then we can kind of have an open discussion on it, okay? Till next time. Later.